Hello and welcome to the Anatomy of a Rifle series. In this video we're going to be running through a couple of components that work together to enable you to adjust up and down, that's your elevation, and left and right, that's your windage, to help you zero your reticle and to compensate for a shot. And it all begins with the erector tube which we ran through in the previous episode which is held at the back by a gimbal but can move freely in the front. It's that movement of the erector tube that gives you your elevation and windage travel. Here's how this works. Your front focal plane is located directly beneath your turrets at the front of the erector tube. Light is gathered by the objective lens and with the help of the parallax lens focuses the image on your front focal plane. The erector tube has a reticle and what we call a field stop inside which essentially crops in on the image from the objective and physically moves around giving you the image and field of view that you see with your eye when you look through the rifle scope. So that explains how we actually get the elevation and windage movement. But how do we control that precisely and repeatably? Well, that's where your turrets come in. Turrets are basically just screws, one to control elevation and one to control windage that can move in and out and allow you to move the erector tube anywhere you want. The spring system on the opposite side of the screws ensures that the erector tube is always held firmly in place against the turrets. In its simplest form, that's all a turret is. It's a threaded screw that can move up and down. But as rifle scopes have evolved, we've added mechanisms to help us to keep track of where we are on that screw's movement and to be able to reach those certain points repeatedly. So we've added what we call a click ring and a click pin, which is basically just a ring with teeth on it and a pin mechanism, which allows you to click from place to place. And because of this, we can now count how many clicks we have in a turn and we can move precisely to a given point. Take that one step further, you can actually change the thread pitch on the screw that moves up and down so you can divide that revolution and all those clicks of of the turret into actual units that translate to angular units of measurement downrange. Started off with an inch at 100 yards, centimeter at 100 meters and that is essentially the same as what we have today the two main units of measurement minutes of angle and milliradians. Originally, elevation and windage adjustments were actually done externally with the entire rifle scope fixed inside adjustable mounts. But people soon realized that these adjustments could be made internally with the screw mechanisms held inside a body tube to protect them. Early internal turrets used to simply be low profile screws with a few markings, possibly telling you the click units and a simple cap to protect them from the elements. But as shooting has evolved with better bullets, better powders, rangefinders, all of those technological advancements, the turrets are no longer just for zeroing a rifle scope and leaving it. We actually want to dial in a firing solution for those longer range shots. So we started adding different mechanisms to make things more user friendly. The ability to slip the turret back to zero, the ability to count which revolution you're on, and even zero stops which help you to more easily locate your zero when dialing back after a shot. I won't go into all the specific details of different turret designs on the market because there's so many ways to do things and so many different approaches to the mechanical side of how turrets work. But I will say that it's pretty incredible to see how far we've come and that there's so much more than meets the eye. Material selection for different components is critical. We have specific hardness specs that certain parts that move against each other have to meet machining tolerances for all the little bits and pieces to ensure that tracking performance is up to standard. There's a lot going on here. Some of you may have noticed a potential problem with having your erector tube as a circle or cylinder inside your body tube. And that is that if you dial close to your maximum of elevation and windage and put that erector tube right up against your body tube and then try to dial in the opposite direction or perpendicular to that, you actually end up pressing against the body tube and that's not good. That can result in extra force being put on components that shouldn't have force put on them. It can cause dead clicks where you think you're dialing but the erector tube's not actually moving like it should or it can cause your erector tube to actually move in a different direction to what you're trying to dial and none of those are good things. 
The solution is to mechanically limit how far the erector tube can actually move to create a rectangular range of movement instead of a circular range of movement. You'll often see on our spec sheets that we have less windage travel than we do elevation travel. That's done intentionally. By limiting the windage travel, we actually allow more room for the elevation side of that rectangle. The key when designing the turret system is to find that sweet spot, giving the shooter enough windage travel while still maximizing elevation travel. Now let's talk about erector springs because there are a number of ways to do this. The concept is the same for all of them. You want to maintain pressure on that erector tube and hold it against the turrets, but there's different approaches to this. One way is to use a coil spring. And if you see a spring retainer cap like this one on the Helix, the rifle scope most likely has a coil spring. Another option is to use a leaf spring. This normally sits in more or less the same area, right in front of the erector tube. Another more modern approach that we use in some of our rifle scopes is to have a number of springs located more towards the, the back end of the erector tube, which actually keep pressure from slightly different angles. And the idea here is that it doesn't take up as much space in the front of the erector tube for travel, and it maintains a more even spring tension no matter where the erector tube is. Bottom line though is the most important thing is that the spring maintains its force against the erected tube, even with repeated use over time. The material should not fatigue. And that just about covers it for this section of the series. I hope you found it informative, and in the next one we'll dive into reticles and illumination. Hope to see you there.